Hi, I'm Jalen Rose, and welcome to the Renaissance Man podcast, proudly presented by the New York Post, a show we cover trends in fashion, entertainment, current events, and everything in between. My next guest is one of the most talented people in the game. He's an actor, producer, comedian, writer, film director, and made his mark in TV, film, comedy, and in the culture. He's currently on his microphone fiend tour. Got to have the Rock Him plan on the way out. Yeah. And you can find those dates and cities on all of his social media, plus on Marlon Wayans official.com. It is my honor to welcome the hilarious Marlon Wayans to the Renaissance Man podcast. What up, my brother? What's up, man? I don't think I'm gonna be able to follow myself after that intro. I was like, damn, I did a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and well deserved, my brother. Tell me about growing up in New York City and how it ended up shaping who you are today. I uh, wouldn't change it, change it for the world. Best best time was my childhood, man. Like growing up in in the bricks down in uh, and now it's called it was the hood back in the day, but now it's 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 the meatpacking district. So there goes my my wow. my street cred. Yeah. So, but growing up in that neighborhood, man, was it was rough, but it, it was perfect. I wouldn't change anything. All the obstacles that we've seen and all the trouble that I dodged and having the insight and the perspective to make fun of all that was dark. I mean, all the characters that was in that neighborhood, you know, uh, to me, I, I wouldn't change it for the world, man. New York is my, always going to be my home. Absolutely. And your family name is one of the most talented in the history of Hollywood. Literally, that's no cap. And so this is a unique question for you. What comics were you watching growing up? And when did you realize that you actually were funny? Um, I it's funny because, uh, uh, of course, I love Eddie Murphy, uh, Richard Pryor. I used to, I used to sneak and listen to my brothers sneaking, listening to Richard Pryor. Album. <laughs> so they were sneaking from my parents, and we were sneaking from them underneath the bed or outside the door. We put a little hole in the door. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to listen to Richard Pryor's great albums. Um, but it's funny, I, I was lucky. I grew up in a house with all of my favorite comedians, my brothers. And you grow up, and in, 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 I was in comedy clubs since I was six years old, going to comedy clubs and watching my brothers put together sets. I, I knew everybody. I knew Eddie Murphy when I was like eight. I knew, oh. you know, Chris Rock since I was like 10. Like, I grew up, uh, Robert Townsend, I, I grew up in it. Um, as far as me uh, knowing I was funny, I think when we was kids, we used to make my brothers laugh. They used to come home from, from California, and me and Sean, we have sketches for them. You know, we always had a sketch. We always had a character. We always had something. We always had a prank. We was pulling on my mom. My mom used to crack corny jokes, and <laughs> me and my brother started killing her when she did corny jokes. Like, we pretend killer. We'd put a plastic bag over her head and snuff her out, or, you know, or pretend walk by with a knife and stab her, and you know, wow. <laughs> drop the knife. So we, we just had a silly household. My mom would laugh, you know, because she knew the joke was corny. But man, I, we always knew he was funny. It was, and then I knew I was funny when um, and I, I got I got the mumps in first grade, and I was always the class clown. I got the mumps, and I was gone for two weeks. Mm. And when I came back, I got a standing ovation from the class because they couldn't believe that the funny guy was gone and school wasn't the same. And so right. I just knew that everybody was going to learn. I was going to school because there was 30 people, which was an audience for me. What was uh, just a typical day in the house of so many talented people, so many funny people? Give me one of your most memorable Christmases or holidays when all of your family was in the same place at the same time and you got a chance to look around and be like, this is incredible what we've accomplished. Um, I can't pick one. It's it's funny because, you know, all of them have been so great and magical. And whenever you get us together, like recently, you know, every Christmas, my mom made sure we had Christmas. My dad was Joe Witness, so he didn't celebrate. But my mom was like, we gonna, we gonna celebrate. And mm -hmm. every year, I don't know how she got the money. I don't know if she was slanging ass or slanging dope. 
but she <laughs> somehow found a way to get every kid a gift. And uh, but we still carry that tradition to this day. Like you know, I'll have a, you know a barbecue and have my entire family over, and it's always last. My sister's out. I'm at, out in North Carolina right now at my sister's house, and we just hang out. You put three Wayneses in a room, you're gonna get jokes. My sisters who are famous are actually really funny. They would be canceled for sure. But they were <laughs> they were funny, unfiltered for sure. So what about oh, this? What about acknowledging one of your siblings and seeing one of your favorite projects that they've ever done. One of my favorite projects that one of my siblings have done. Correct. Uh, I would say in living color was the most impressive thing that mm. our family has done and involved all of us. But before I got on the show, you know, I remember I was 16 or three years old when they did the pilot and I was out in California and they was doing these sketches, man. And I remember Damon did that oppression sketch. It was instead of obsession, <laughs> it was Calvin Klein's oppression. It was, you know, a, a white lady slaps a slave and he's like, if something is a sin, then I'll be guilty. And I watched that. And I watched Mike T Keenan do Mike Tyson with Jim Carrey on uh, the dating game. Or what was it? Love Connection. And... I was laughing until I was sick. And I was like, yo, if this makes the air, it's it's going to change the game. And once it made mm -hmm. the air, I was at Howard University at the time. And I remember every Sunday, 8 o'clock, Howard no shut doubt. down. No everybody doubt. went to the dorms and everybody's watching the Living no Color. No doubt. And, you know, and it was dope to be a Living Color's brother wherever I was. So, you know, I'm always impressed by that. That's the, that, to me, is the most historic comedic thing that ever happened to television it yeah. it really blended the past edginess of certain artists and the future now as we see it where things are just more unfiltered to your yeah. point about your sisters that's why they will quote unquote get canceled right now versus then because it was so groundbreaking then so what are some yeah. of your favorite sketches oh uh, man homie the clown um, you don't play I, that. My, my brothers did. Uh, Damon wrote a brilliant sketch. Uh, it was Louis Farrakhan and uh, Al Sharpton, and <laughs> the name of the sketch was was Jews on First, and <laughs> it was just a brilliant sketch. And it was it was back when people had a sense of humor and right. would laugh, and it was it's just a, a brilliant sketch. It was basically who's on first, but it was Jews on first, and then it's about <laughs> who's on second. Why did well? I thought well, who's on third? That would be okay. But I thought, and they just talked about all these different uh, names that they that, that they refer to white people as, <laughs> and it was just so funny. And it well, I think without humor, right. We've been able, I think Men on, Men on Films was brilliant, right? I, I think with our humor, we have a certain recipe, right? Our, we're offensively hilarious, right? So it's not that it's offensive. Well said. Because our goal is always to make, our jokes bring people together. They mm -hmm. don't make people, they don't, they don't they separate them. They're, it's not divisive. We do mm -hmm. jokes that are inclusive. And when we do a mm -hmm. joke, the people we make fun of laugh the loudest. <laughs> and, you know, and that's what we did. I mean, Jewish people love Jews on first. And when we did um, uh, Men on Films, you know who love Men on Films most? The gay community. Like, mm -hmm. we, and that was the first time that you had the gay people in your living room represented mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. outwardly, you know what I mean? Right. In, in the forms of comedy. And mm -hmm. it kind of made you feel comfortable about your gay cousin or your, your, your gay uncle or, mm -hmm. you know, the p people in your family that, or you know, were, were homosexual. You it, it made you a little bit more comfortable with it, mm -hmm. but you could still laugh at it, and they laugh too. I think that's what's missing with today. I think social media messed up socializing, and we got to get back to laughing and well finding said. reasons to laugh and stop being so damn sensitive. Because all we're doing is filling our airways, filling our our kids with fear and hate. Yep. and there's yep. no laughter and love, and the only Correct. thing that's gonna bring us together is humor. So that's well said. And there was a time, however, you decided you were going to stop doing stand up. And that's after Chris Rock heckled you. He sure did. 
Can you tell me that story? Oh, man. I love Rock. Rock, I, I, Rock is like, you know, like my mean big brother. He's he's always like, you know, it's funny. My brothers gave me a different kind of hazing, right? Mm. It was more love, loving because nurturing because they were my brothers. But outside of my brothers, you know, you're still in, when you're in comedy, that's a fraternity. And no Chris was just hazing me the way that probably Damon or Eddie or somebody hazed him or mm -hmm. had called him. And so he, he one night I'm struggling at the Laugh Factory doing my stand up, and man, Chris just heckled me. He heckled me, and I I didn't see who it was, and I looked closer, and where's the jokes at? And I look, oh man, is that Chris Rocker? <laughs> and I just started sweating, and man, he ripped my ass for about mm. five minutes, but it felt like five hours, mm. and I I just was so humiliated. I kind of was, it broke me, and so I I went home and I cried and I quit stand up for twenty years. And then, you know, I, I realized that, you know, if you really want something in life, nothing should stand in your way. Every obstacle is only a reason to go towards your goal. And if you ever quit, that's when that's when you fail, like when you quit mm -hmm. trying. And so uh, 20 years later, I got back on the stage and uh, I'm never getting off again. Not until I got like 40 specials. You know, no and I'm, I'm getting really, I'm getting really nice with the sword. So, because I spend so much time on the stage, you know. In fact, I'm gonna be in New Jersey Pack on uh, Friday. I got two shows. Then on Saturday, I'm in Pennsylvania at, at uh, Parks Casino, and then I'm back at New Jersey Pack for another show on Sunday. That's dope. That's dope, and it's great to see you back doing your thing on the stage. And you've navigated being a public figure and being a celebrity as a youth basically your entire life. And you yeah. turned yourself um, into one of the greats at what you do. But what ends up happening is, in particular, like you said, when anybody could get it and we're laughing, sometimes people want to see the serious side of us. And so, okay. for example, what just happened in Alabama, you know, the yeah. melee in Montgomery. And yeah. I got a chance to watch the video. A gentleman was ba a black gentleman was basically there working, trying to get one boat to move that was sitting in the way, blocking another boat to come in. And before you know it, he basically get rushed by a handful of white guys and young ladies, I believe. Then um, before you know it, there are people that come to his rescue, other black guys. And before you know it, the black guys basically stood up for the guy who was getting beat up who was only trying right. to do his job and right. everybody's going to have a reaction to that. People question or try to, like you said, people think they could cancel, but it ain't nothing to cancel when you know what you're doing and you've been doing it for so very long. So what do you think of the reaction to everything in particular, your tweet? I think society, people are a lot dumber than I thought. Like they don't know irony and sarcasm. Here's a song that was so divisive, right? That song, somewhere in a small town, black people who didn't like it, it mm -hmm. was not a cool song to put out. Hold on, sorry. No worries. Hold on. Not a cool song to put out, you know? And that kind of song is the kind of mentality that fuels, I'm, I'm on the phone, why are people calling me? No worries. Um, that fuels, you know, these type of situations, right? When it and and it 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 fuels a lot of like racism and bigotry and and some violence. Like it, it the whole message of the song, you know? And so I thought it, it like here's a situation where that mentality was starting and here's where it all goes wrong. So mm -hmm. how about we not try this in a small town? Mm -hmm. And people was like, oh I'm all the way in. I can't believe I woke up this morning. I was like, "Are you kidding me? Like y'all, y'all didn't get y'all didn't get the joke, right? You didn't get the fact that you're playing this song as black people are <laughs> defending themselves and whooping ass, and you got this song playing. So now I will say this: I, I, I I'm not one for like war, right? Mm -hmm. But I am one for self defense, no doubt. And I feel like you know, look, claps, man, that because we've seen it go the other way.
We've seen mm. the George Floyds. We've seen the, mm. you know, we, we, we've seen so much. We've been through so much. And Rihanna Taylor, like, absolutely. Yeah, black people on their toes right now, right? So it's just like, uh, why is everybody calling me at two o'clock? What is going on? <laughs> um, um, so for me, I look at it and go, it's an opportunity for humor, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, as much as I see all the things that's relevant in there, especially, you know, seeing black people stand up for each other, not just walking mm -hmm. by, but protecting each other like brothers, that, that's dope. I'm not one to want to see any kind of fight, you know what I'm saying? But that was a situation that could have went wrong and, you know, it, it turned out a different way. And for me, I sit there and go, I see something different when I see that. I see mm -hmm. humor. When I seen <laughs> the brother in the water swimming his way to No the doubt. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. We got to get him to the Olympics. I, I had <laughs> to rewind that. Because that, that, that. No, no like, doubt. Oh, hell no. I don't even know if he knew he could swim. Right. <laughs> like, I was thinking, he was like, hold on, am I in the water? I look when the, when the brother took his hat off and was like, here Threw we it go. in the air. He threw that hat. <laughs> I see something <laughs> different, right? I look for the things to laugh about. And then, of course, I'm going to go, listen, it don't have to go this way or that way. What we should do at some point is let's not go there. Let's just mm. not go there. Let's all be right. more human. Let's all be more respectful. Let's stop, you know, doing stupid songs like that that promote this kind of like negativity toward mm -hmm. black people. That ain't cool, you know. Excuse me, right. um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, so I, I mean, I just you know, once again, when something comes, I try to give it back to the world with a little bit of humor behind it. And I thought the irony of the song it was funny. Some people got it. Some people didn't. And honestly, I'm not one to explain jokes. If y'all know me, y'all no at, doubt. I, I looked at this. I was like, Nigga, since when I become Candace Owen? You don't see me. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not that dude. I've never right. been. I'm, right. I'm the blackest dude you can ever. I'm black. I'm black. Why would I not support black people? Why would I? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't support any violence. But it was nice to see black people show up for black people. No doubt. You know? No doubt. And, and like. You don't only walk it, but you and talk I hope it. When I did that video, that the people that questioned me, I hope they unfollowed me. Because if you don't know me by now, off. I don't need like right. like to even question me like that. It's just like, you know what? You y'all just y'all just looking for stuff right now. Y'all just right. looking for, you know, this this is just like uh and then for the sites to pick this up, like I like, like really, like really, guys, y'all, mm -hmm. y'all try to put this narrative out about me. I ain't that guy, man. I say what I say, and I live by it, and it is what it is. And if I thought the other way, then I would say it, and I would mm -hmm. live by that. But mm -hmm. that wasn't the case, so you know. Agreed, uh, agreed. Uh, That's why I'm glad you got a chance to speak on it. And also, you, you showed that in this interview. Just think about this, and I want to say rest in peace because I know you just lost both of your parents within the last couple yes, of sir. years. And mm -hmm. I lost my mom in 2021. And the, the one Sorry thing you that, did, brother. thank you, brother, you, you as well. And the one thing you did in this very interview that highlights why you've been so very successful and unfiltered, you started off telling a joke about how you and Sean played jokes and did skits on your mom. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So so yeah. you're that same person. Most people probably wouldn't tell that joke. I I'm raised to tell the jokes and I will never I will never fear telling my jokes. I like like I said, I know what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. and if and and any I don't care what society brings this way. I'm always going to defend the line of the first amendment. What people mm -hmm. are so lost Everybody's so lost in the social media. And they're not understanding the bigger agenda. Most of the people on social media with these opinions aren't even real people. They're mm -hmm. bots from other countries yes. that are trying to start turmoil in our country. They're trying to strip us of the very thing that makes our country special, the freedom of speech. 
not only the yes. freedom of speech, but the harmony that we have collectively, multiple mm -hmm. races, genders, uh, uh, um, uh, sexualities, everybody, we all live here in this country and mm -hmm. mostly in harmony, laughing and making fun of each other. And here you got all these other thing, uh, countries coming in and they're dividing us. And we're so stupid mm -hmm. that we allow this to happen. Sooner or later, they're going to take away the First Amendment. They're mm. going to take it away because they we're all going to have to think alike. We're all going to everything. People are going to get canceled. You can't think this. What kind of society are we living in? It's OK. I have Democrat friends. I got Republican friends. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I, I don't know which one I love more. I don't care. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I got black friends. I got white friends. I got Puerto Rican friends. I got Dominican friends. I got Cuban friends. Mm -hmm. I got Asian friends. I make fun of all of us because Correct. that's what we do. And there's no never going to be a day where I don't do that because I do it with love and I'm always going to do it with love and we're different and it's okay to laugh at things. I laugh my way through life and those that want to mm -hmm. live with the drama, y'all can find the drama and find the tears. I'm going to find these jokes. No doubt. Laugh now and cry later. And uh, one thing I always say, also, you can be mean if you funny. Yeah. Yeah, you, if it's you funny, can, <laughs> right? Listen, people, people, <laughs> honestly, you can be racist if you're funny. Don right. Rickles had some of the most Legend. racist jokes. Yes, but if you think I would go back and cancel Don Rickles, no, he had some black mm -hmm. jokes that I would go. That's funny. He was funny. Funny no is doubt. funny. That's no all. It, 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 if you, if it's good, it's funny. It's like you know. Uh, I thought Robert, De I'm not a big fan of blackface. I think it's disrespectful to black people uh, after all we've been through to get that kind of mockery. But man, when Robert Downey Jr. did this in Tr Tropic Thunder, I laughed. Right. I was like, that's good. Right. That was good. A good joke is a good joke. Period. It is. And I'm not going to be mad about it. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. part, uh, I'm always going, as a comedian, I'm always going to defend comedy, right? Right. And especially if it's funny. And I still believe that dark humor is, brings us light because it brings mm -hmm. us laughter and we got to get back to it. And if, if people want to live in a sensitive world that they're creating, they can do that. I'm just not going to join. I, Cause I remember some of my favorite shows, watching them all of the time, like the Jeffersons or Sanford and son or good times, but don't yes. think I wasn't watching Archie Bunker. Archie too, Bunker. Cause I Archie was, Bunker. and I That's laughed funny. watching right. that show. Right. I, I right. died laughing when George and Weezy used to come on there and and, and, yeah. and all of the stuff that he used to be saying to Edith and they're like, whoa, I used to watch Dukes of Hazard. They had right. a, a they had a, a a Confederate flag on top of the car. On the roof. Right. Right. <laughs> but Literally. see that nowadays, you know, you can't even like the way that and it's 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 sad because I think that the social media has influenced the media, which influences the executives that make mm -hmm. the decisions. And they're homogenizing creativity. And you mm -hmm. can't you can't do that. You have to they right. they're not what look at the movies. They're not even doing comedies anymore. Mm -hmm. All the movies they're doing superheroes and tent poles, they're mm -hmm. probably doing two or three comedies. What is mm -hmm. a world where there's no comedy in theaters? What kind of world are we living in? Like Great people point. need comedy, people need laughter. And I feel mm. like right now for me is a great time for a brand like ours, the Wayans brand. I'm mm -hmm. gonna go get me a nice big film fund and I'm gonna do what nobody knows how to do, which is make Let's really go. big, funny comedies. Let's That's what go. I'm yes, sir. I'm, we need that. The culture need that. Society needs it. Entertainment needs that creativity. As you mentioned, everything That's why becomes I keep dropping specs. That's why I keep dropping specials. That's why I stay on the road. People need people need laughs. They mm -hmm. need the laughs, man. People and, and you know what's crazy is like I can make jokes about the darkest things because I make fun of me. Correct. As well. Right? When I talk about equal opportunity offender, I talk about myself. I mm -hmm. I talk about, you know, I talk about my parents. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And my set. And I talk about struggling and and with grief with losing mm -hmm. your parents but here's this dark subject and then it's really really funny mm -hmm. it's hilarious and there's some heart in it because mm -hmm. one day we all go through it yeah and it, it's healing and mm -hmm. uh it's a it's a this set i'm doing is a great set 
I'm probably gonna film it at the Apollo probably in November. Um, yeah. My mom, my mom performed at the Apollo, and my parents grew up in Harlem, so I wanted to go home and uh, and and do this special on that stage that my mom performed at, and um, send my farewells. You know. That's incredible. I, I admire you, man. I admire your strength, your wisdom, your talent. Um, because I know that Apollo, that's gonna be tough. Yeah, but not. Nah, it's gonna be light. It'll be tough at the You're gonna make it light. And that's that's, that's so your brilliance. Historic. Yeah. That, that that that's that's your brilliance, brother. I admire that. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be there for that because that's gonna be crazy. Speaking yeah, man, pull of pull up. I am well, pull up to NJ Pack if you're in New York. Um uh, this weekend, uh, Friday, I got two shows. Then I'm in Parks Casino in Philly, and then I'm back at New Jersey Pack in Newark uh, on Sunday. But um, I was gonna say, you know, comedy saves my life a lot of times. You know, when I found out my father passed, I was I just pulled up to a comedy show I had to do in Burbank, and right before I went on stage, I found out my dad died. Mm. And I didn't cancel the show. I mm. did my show. I made him laugh. Did some jokes about, including some things about my dad, but I didn't let the audience know that my dad passed. Mm. And then right after it, I let the audience know that, you know, I got a stand ovation and I let the audience know that my dad passed. Mm. And I broke down on the stage after. But during, mm. I delivered those smiles. And, um, you know, nothing stops the show. So, you know, and I know my purposes. I know why God got me here. God got me here to, to deliver smiles. If that, I was an angel, I would be the, the deliverer of smiles. You doing it, brother. What what are what are your top five cities to perform stand up in? I'm gonna tell you right now, Jersey's crazy. Because Jersey is like New York, but New York got too expensive, so everybody moved to Jersey. So <laughs> right. it's a bunch of <laughs> right. it's the realest people. In New York, that's uh -huh. in Jersey. I would say Jersey, Atlanta. Uh, uh, man, what was our last? And they were going crazy. Um, uh, Philly, uh, New York, and uh, man, it was one place that they were going crazy. I just it slipped my mind. I forgot where, but and and uh, a lot of Texas too, like uh, mm -hmm. Dallas and Houston. Houston, mm -hmm. crazy. But That's I love, I, honestly, I, I performed in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, Australia, everywhere I go. It's not about the crowd. It's mm -hmm. about, you know, give me a give me a microphone, give me a stage, give me a stool, give me a light, give me some water, and give me however many semi-drunk people you want to give me, and I'm going to give them, <laughs> I'm going I'm to I'm 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 hurt their ass. And microphone I'm, I'm fiend. To... Yes, sir. Was a fiend yes. before I became a teen. And yep. I know you standing with your colleagues in the entertainment industry who are on strike. What are your hopes as the strike continues to happen, at least for the next few weeks or so? I hope that, um, uh, you know, I, I hope on both sides, you know, I, I think the studios need to start respecting the talent and we need to start making more money. I, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's sad that a lot of actors can barely pay their rent. You know what I mean? It's like, I look at, we look at sports and we're like, man, they making money right now. They mm -hmm. making cotton and, and right. you know, these big studios, they making money. And so the big stars need to make more money and the actors need to make more money and the crews need to make more money and the writers need to have more ownership. You know, we create this stuff that goes on those, um, on those platforms yet we have no ownership. It ain't mm. about a buyout. You know, I didn't create this to, for you to buy me out. I create this, I, we can share it, you know, because mm -hmm. without you there, this doesn't get seen by many eyeballs, but I'm I'm in this place of my life where I, I don't, I don't want to give it up no more. You know, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I want to have ownership and, and, you know, and they're taking out back in and, you know, they're paying you up front for your back in and, it's like, nah, you want to get paid per view. If I, you know, as no many doubt. views as people actually continue to make money as people view my stuff. And, you know, what they're fighting for, they, let them fight. Let them fight mm -hmm. until, until we we get what we, we deserve, you know? Well said. And as you mentioned, athletes, 
when you look back at the history of sports, multiple times athletes have gone on strike. Yeah. Sometimes you got to hurt, hurt their pockets. They need you without them. Without, and they can do AI if they try to. AI can never do what we do in terms of, for mm-hmm. me, as a comedian. Why? Because AI has never lived my life. They don't have my experience. They don't have my journey. The reason why I see the world the way I do is because I grew up in the projects of New York City and Mm -hmm. I had all this dark stuff happening. And I always said, what's funny about this dark stuff? And no matter what dark situation I went into, I always said, what's funny about this? What's funny about this? You can't replicate that. So, I mean, it could type fast. It'll give you an outline, but it can't give you these jokes. So. But what what's crazy, and you really got me thinking, uh, like it would be blasphemous for somebody to try to say recreate living color, for example, or recreate white chicks, or do whatever. They they, they use they AI. Do, uh, well, that that's even more blasphemous. But they try to do it and replace us with you know other other creators. That's the thing about my family. Like people. After a point, they tried it with scary movie, and they got they got two off, and then they was like, mm-hmm. "Wait, where do I end that? This don't mm-hmm. taste right. This mm-hmm. ain't the same." They tried one more season of the Living Color without the fam. They were like, "Wait, something drastically happened." I know Chris Rock is on here, and that mm-hmm. Bismarcky, something's going on. You mm-hmm. know, um, it's hard to do re- what we do, you know, because what we do is uh, it's in our DNA. Absolutely. And before I let you get out of here, microphone fiend, Marlon Wayans, I have a rapid fire segment called Gone in 60 Seconds. You ready to do this? Do it. Presented by Tri-State Cadillac Dealers. Go. Name your favorite food spot in New York City. Oh, man. Uh, It would be a a Blue Ribbon Brasserie down uh, in the village. They have this great fried chicken there. Death all oh, the crust on that chicken is heavenly. Yeah, yeah man. And, and it, a little it's, honey and like it, sauce and whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm no, always there late night. No doubt, no doubt. And I see you bought your kick game. So what's your yeah. favorite pair as it relates to your uh, go-to kicks? Jordan ones, but it's the Jordan, it's actually the Chicago's that Virgil remixed. So it's the mm. Nike Virgil collab. Mm. That's my, I wore those in my first special Wokish, and now they're worth like seventy five grand. But they're Ooh. they're great. My favorite shoe. Ooh, those are classic. How about this? In they're an sick. alternate reality, what other career besides making people laugh do you think you'd be good at? A lawyer. I'd have been a great lawyer. Interesting. I just don't like studying that much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lastly, but certainly not least, give me three words to describe your upcoming tour. Uh, crazy, funny, fearless. I'm going to add a fourth. And, and uh, heartwarming. Well, you deserve it, brother. You've been putting in the work. You're one of the most talented brothers in the game to ever do it. I'm a huge fan, and I'm definitely going to get out there to see you and support you. Thank you for taking the time. All right, brother. I appreciate you, Mike.